welcome here to worship as we celebrate um, our Savior who is risen. Last week we remembered and celebrated the good news that Jesus is alive, that Easter um, happened, that Jesus is risen from the tomb, and Jesus is still alive and still changing lives today. And so we're going to celebrate and remember and reflect upon that good news that Easter is still um, the case, that Jesus is still alive, that Jesus still changes lives, your life, my life, and many lives across the globe. But first we're going to um, praise God in song. Um, We're going to open up for a couple of songs called Open the Eyes of My Heart, Lord, and then All Heaven Declares. We'll stand for both, and on the first one um, we will say um, the first verse and chorus, and then um, the praise group and organ um, will play um, the remainder for us. So let's stand and worship our God. We'll say this first verse and chorus. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. To see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. that has come before our God in prayer, will close with the words of the Lord's Prayer that appear on the screen. Let us pray. All heaven declares the glory of the risen Lord. Who can compare with the beauty 
of the Lord. Forever he will be the Lamb upon the throne. I gladly bow the knee and worship him alone. Lord, indeed we come here to adore you and make much of you, to bask in your glorious presence, to worship you and you alone. We come to you this day and acknowledge that you alone are God Almighty, that you're the one who rules over time and space. You're the source of all that is good, all that is true, and you're the author of our life. You're infinite and eternal. You're unchangeable in your wisdom, power, holiness, justice, goodness, love, and truth. And above all, O Lord, we come to honor you. For although you are our creator, you are also our father, our redeemer, our king, and our friend. And Lord, as we think and contemplate on the magnitude of what you've done for us, we can barely begin to comprehend it. That you would step off your glorious throne, that you would enter into our time, into our place, enter into the muckness and the the mire of this world, to be slandered and ridiculed, ignored and beaten, falsely accused, crucified and killed. And why would you do that? Out of your love for us, out of the depths of your love for us. But Lord, even though we've received that love, that love that has been poured out upon us, So often we've not lived up to that family name that you've won for us. That you've adopted us as your children and yet as your children we've turned our back. Too often we're more ready to resent than to forgive. More ready to manipulate than to serve. More ready to fear than to love. More ready to compete than to help. Forgive us for when we have not loved you and loved others as we should. When the words of our mouth have not been um, uplifting and encouraging, loving and true. When we have acted out of arrogance, when we have not served and loved and cherished others in the way that you have loved and served and cherished us. But, O gracious Redeemer, your word assures us that our faith, our confidence, when it's in Jesus then our sins, whatever they are, eternally are forgiven. So Lord, we praise you that Jesus has come for us, that our sins are forgiven, that he is alive and that our sins are wiped clean. Lord, to fill us again with the joy of your presence, astound us with the truth of your word, captivate us with your love, for we gather as your people, and in the words of your dear Son we pray together. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever. Amen. Before we go on, just a couple of announcements and notices um, for us today. The first is thank you for um, signing up um, for uh, for worship today. Um, If you haven't signed up for future weeks um, throughout April, um, then please uh, do so. Um, You can sign up with those details um, there, or if you're not able to do so, um, then you can tick your name on the way out. Peter, I think there's someone outside. Um, and uh, so please do sign up for the next um, couple of weeks just to let us know um, who's coming in advance and um, to take your names off um, once you arrive. The second thing is that Margaret's going to come up and ex- um, talk a little bit about this. Um, but in a couple of weeks' time, um, we're going to be raising money for Christian Aid. Um, over the next month would be usually Christian Aid Week. Obviously, still in COVID times, we're not able to do all that we normally want to do, um, but we're going to do something, and Margaret's going to explain what we're doing. Yeah, so this year with COVID affected everything um, and we met as World Mission Team a wee while ago and decided that it would be really good to take part in the Scotland's virtual kilt walk which as Andrew said is in two weeks time. Um, one of the advantages of doing that is that all the money that we raise and um, there'll be an extra 50% added on on top of all donations um, towards Christian aid. So 
you know, it's just a really good opportunity. And of course, we live in such a beautiful part of the world as well. So what we've decided to do is we, um, as the World Mission team, have come up with four different lengths of walks so that as many people as possible can take part in it, if you want to. So the shortest one is just under three miles, and the longest one is 16. So it's around about three, no, I can't remember all the length of the walks, five, seven, and 16. Or you can do a different walk completely. But we thought it'd be quite nice to do it as a church and to meet together on Saturday the 24th at City Flat Farm at 10 o'clock. We'll have social distancing in place. Um, we'll have maps available for everyone who wants to do it. So if you'd like to take part and um, on any of the walks, if you could let me know um, either by phoning me or emailing me, the, my details are there, or just speak to me at the end of the service this morning, that'd be brilliant. Um, the other thing is with COVID, um, obviously we're trying not to handle money more than we need to. There, there will be some sponsor forms available at the back for the whole church team. We're doing it as a group. Um, Jill and I have registered as individuals, but the money that's raised will be for the whole team um, so that we can just kind of pool our resources. So if you want to sponsor the team, there's some forms um, on the table on the way out. Um, if you don't have means of doing online, if you do and you um, follow the church Facebook page or whatever, you will find details um, from that over the next couple of weeks. So we'd encourage you to do it that way. But we'd really like as many folks as possible to do it. And even if you think three miles is a bit far and you want to do something shorter or something flatter, Sheila's going to do a flatter walk. You know, there's all sorts of options, but we thought if we meet up at Silly Flat Farm, just outside Burvey, um, then that kind of gives us a sense of doing it together. And then little teams will go out. At the moment, it'll just be two households um, on the different lengths of walks. But if you'd like to be involved, um, please speak to me afterwards. We also have Christian Day t-shirts that we can get for free for anyone who'd like one, but I need to know that within the next few days. So hopefully we'll be able to raise a lot of money for Christian Aid Week. Um, Christian Aid Week isn't till, March, till May, but this is our main fundraising thing that we're going to be doing this year. And hopefully we'll get sun, sunny weather and have a lovely day um, just doing this money for such a worth, worth, worthwhile cause together. Okay, thank you. Wonderful. And although it's called a kilt walk, um, kilts or tartan are um, optional, that's up to you. Um, I was, I was going to go to, to the 16 mile walk and I was thinking, I don't know if I want to walk 16 miles in a kilt, um, especially if it's got the same weather as we've had this past week. But, uh, um, but yeah, kilts, tartan, optional, um, but we'd encourage you to get involved. If you can go for a walk um, on that day or indeed other days, um, then we'd love for you to be involved. Or if you can't, then we'd encourage you um, to give. So as Margaret said, Giving online will be preferable, details will be out soon, or if you can't give online, you don't have access to the internet, then you can give um, physical cash um, using the sponsorship forms as well. Um, speaking of that, if you have brought an offering with you today, um, or you want to give, then you can uh, give on the way out um, to plates as you leave this morning. But uh, let us move on. And we are now going to um, read our scripture reading for this morning, which is uh, Luke chapter 24, reading from verse 13 to 35. We've got a church Bible. It's on page um, 1061, um, or it's on the screen. So Luke chapter 24, reading from verse 13. So it's taking place um, so a few hours after the story we'd let, read last week about the resurrection account where um, some of the women go to the tomb and find that Jesus um, is no longer there. The angels say that he's risen from the dead, go and tell the disciples, and um, they run off and then they meet Jesus face to face. This happens just a few hours after that event. So let's hear what Luke writes. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing them, him. He asked them, What are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem? to not know about these things that have happened there in these days. What things? 
Jesus asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all of the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, this is the third day since all of this took place. In addition, some of our women, um, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the woman had said, but him they did not see. He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus acted as if he was going further, but they urged him strongly. Stay with us, for it's nearly evening, the day is almost over. And so he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And he disappeared from their sight. They asked each other, Were not our eyes burning, our hearts burning within us, while he talked with us in the road and opened the scriptures to us? Then he got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven disciples and those with them assembled together. And saying, it is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told him what had happened on the way. And how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. Amen. We're going to explore this a little bit more about how um, the eyes of Cleopas and his friend were opened. And how our our eyes are opened by Jesus as well. We're going to stand and we're going to worship God in song again. um, By singing um, or listening along to By Faith. Um, And what we'll do is we'll listen along to the praise group leading the first few verses and we will see the final one um, and the chorus. So when the music stops, um, then we will see that final verse and chorus. But let's stand and worship God. By faith we see the hand of God.
by faith this mountain shall be moved and the power of the gospel shall prevail for we know in christ all things are possible for those who call upon his name we will stand as children of the promise we will fix our eyes on him our soul's reward till the race is finished and the work is done we'll walk by faith and not by sight isn't it amazing when everything becomes clear I'm not a huge fan of um, history, but uh, when I was at university the first time, I did a, a one-year course in um, archaeology as part of um, I had to do a few different things, and I uh, did an archaeology course for a year. And uh, I remember during, during that time or before that time, it reminded me of um, how people discovered um, what hieroglyphics um, meant, the old writing things that the pharaohs and the ancient Egyptians would have used because they used it back then then they all died out, they all changed their culture, etc. No longer were using hieroglyphics. So when um, folk went and discovered the pyramids, etc., they found these little pictures, and they're like, you can guess what some of it might mean, but we have no idea how to read it. It would be like a, a, you trying to read, um, I imagine, most of us cannot read um, the, sort of, um, the scripts of um, the Arabic language would use, or the, the language of... Um, uh, like uh, Eastern, Europe, Eastern Asian languages, sorry, as well, a different script. We would not understand it whatsoever, all the pictures, all the, the glyphs and the images. And so, but the reason that they could work out what it meant was that one day someone discovered a thing that's now been called the Rosetta Stone, where on this was three different languages. There was Greek, everyday Egyptian, and then the hieroglyphics as well. And so what happened was that somebody went, well, I can understand the Greek, I can understand the Egyptian, and it says the same things in both those languages. I wonder if the hieroglyphics, it says the exact same thing. And from that, everything became clear. Suddenly, that was the key that opened up all of the hieroglyphics across all the pyramids and so on. Or when you've not understood something, and then you get the missing piece of information, it suddenly makes everything clear. How many of us have had a discussion, debate, argument a discussion or debate or argument with a loved one or a friend or someone else and it's been because you didn't understand what was being said there's been some piece of missing information I'm sure it doesn't just happen in the Morrison household but when you do get a missing piece of information suddenly one of you has to apologize usually me but that's exactly what is happening here on the road to Emmaus we see two people Cleopas and his friend and they get some missing piece of information. Everything becomes clear for them. Last week, we were celebrating the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, that Jesus, the Son of God, is alive, that he rules and reigns over all things. He's conquered death and evil. And over these next few weeks, I want us to journey together with those first witnesses to the resurrection, exploring the events that happened after Easter, because Jesus is still alive and still changes everything. So the next few weeks, we're going to be looking through a series called Alive, thinking about, well, what happened after that first initial Easter Sunday? Because it's very easy to have your Easter Sunday and uh, have your hot cross buns, eat your Easter eggs, and then go on your Easter day walk, and then by next Sunday, that's long ago. Everything's back to normal. It's like, I guess, after Christmas or whatever else, you go back to work, and the first few days of January, decorations are gone away, all the parties have stopped, Christmas was long ago in the past. It's like that with Easter as well. But I want us to continue to focus on Easter, thinking about, well, what happened after Easter? How did we get from Easter Sunday to us here today, 2,000 years later on? We're going to dig into these key events, the encounters that Jesus has with people over these next few weeks until we reach Pentecost at the end of May which took place about seven weeks after Jesus rose from the dead. So we've just read of the account of the Emmaus journey. Only a few hours after the events of um, the people discovering that Jesus is alive. Well, what's happened so far? Well, that morning, some women go to the tomb to anoint and to embalm the body of Jesus. They go there and they find the stone is rolled away. And the angels tell them, Jesus is alive. Go and tell the disciples he's no longer here. Some of the women go and 
find some of the disciples and say, Jesus is alive. But before they get there, Jesus encounters them on that road. And separately, John Gospels tells us that Mary Magdalene ran separately to find um, Peter and John. And Peter and John go and find that the tomb is empty, and they're perplexed and amazed that the, the bandages are there, but the body is not. And Mary walks back to the tomb, dejected, upset, annoyed, because her friend who died is not even in his tomb any longer. And when she is there, Jesus appears to her as well. But now we're a few hours after this. Sometime in the afternoon, the disciples all share these stories together. And in this mix are some friends of Jesus, including a man named Cleopas. And he has to go back to Emmaus, seven miles away with his friend, his companion. And on this journey, Cleopas and his friend are going to have an amazing encounter with Jesus. And I want us today to have an encounter with Jesus, for our eyes to be opened in a way that their eyes were opened, to see Jesus and marvel again at what he has done for us. And there's three core things I want us to think about this morning. The first is that Jesus seeks us. Can you click, I've forgotten to bring Claire. He's a, um, oh no, sorry, go back to that one. Jesus um, there finds the disciples, or Cleopas and his friend, on that road. Jesus seeks them out. We read that Cleopas and his unidentified individual are walking along the road, discussing, debating, thinking, what has happened? How is it that Jesus was dead, but somehow they've told us that he is now alive? Now, we don't know who this other person is. It might be his wife, Cleopas' wife. It might be Luke who wrote this account. It might be someone else entirely. But whoever it is, we don't know, but together they're discussing. And then joining them on that um, journey is Jesus himself. And it's obvious that these two folk knew an awful lot about Jesus, but they hadn't recognized him. They didn't understand all that happened, even though they'd heard all about it. And Jesus, he was going to join them right there on that journey. And even though he joined them, they were blinded. They could not understand, they could not recognize that Jesus was with them. And perhaps one of the reasons might be that events hadn't happened the way they expected. For imagine Cleopas and his friend expected the Messiah to come and be the warrior king, the one who was going to be a ruler, a fighter, an overthrower of the Romans. Jesus had placed, they'd placed all their hope in him, but now he was dead. That's not what we expected. He was the one that we'd followed these past few years, and now he's in the tomb. Jesus our hope is dead. Instead of asking God for more faith or trying to see God's work in all of this, they admit defeat and refuse to see God that he might be doing something here anyway. And you might be thinking of a similar situation where there's been something going on in your life and you're thinking, well, how on earth did this happen? This is not what I expected in my life. This is not the way that I planned for my life to go. I get happily married, but that's no longer the case. I had planned to get this good job, but I got fired or um, our work closed down. I had planned to have a wonderful retirement, but now I'm widowed or I am ill and I'm no longer able to enjoy it in the way that I hoped. Or perhaps I could think of a couple of examples where I've put a lot of effort or time or energy into something um, for the church, and I thought, well, God's surely going to bless us. It's going to be a great thing for the church, expecting thousands to turn up to it thousands of lives to be changed, then two folk show up. That's not the way that I expected it to go. Surely God's going to bring a thousand folk, but no, just one or two. And we don't always see God in the midst of all of this, that God is still with us, God is still journeying with us, that God might even be doing something in our grief, our sorrow, our hurt, our heartache, our pain, and our sorrow. In my example, there has been times where I've been dejected that thousands haven't turned up to something. But I failed to see that God might be actually working in the lives of that one or two folk who show up. After all, we're all of us not one or two individuals at one point. I imagine none of us, um, maybe one or two of us might have been, but um, we probably weren't in that gigantic crowd that came to the hillside and heard Jesus or something wonderful like that. In fact, we were just like Zacchaeus, or we were like some of the other folk in the Gospels, where it's just one person with Jesus. And I go and think, well, what's the point of two folk? That was a waste of time. But actually God said, no, this person or these two people 
are important as well. Or when we're ill and we're bedbound, perhaps God might be trying to help us see, actually, I want you to rest. I want you to recognize that you're no longer in control, that you're not the king of the world. I still am. I think that's why God um, programmed us to sleep for roughly a third of the day. Because when we go to sleep, we cannot control our families. We cannot control our workplace or whatever else goes on in life. Eventually, at the end of the night, you've got to turn off your computer, put in your phone. You've got to stop your worries and just fall asleep. But God is still in charge. God is still on the throne. Even when we are unconscious and dreaming about something far off in a distance. And I wonder also if they had little faith as well. Because it says that they had heard from the women and the disciples of all that had happened. They'd heard from Peter and John, the women at the tomb. They'd heard about the angels, everything else. But they still did not believe. They still did not understand all that had happened. People have this idea that back then people believed any old nonsense because they didn't understand science. And so therefore, if you told them that someone was alive again after dying, of course they'd believe that nonsense. This clearly demonstrates that they did not believe that. They were certain that their best friend was still dead in a tomb or had been moved elsewhere. They could not understand that Jesus was alive. And sometimes we are like that as well. We know all the truth, we know about the gospel truth, and yet we just don't believe. We just don't have faith that Jesus really is who he says he is, that Jesus really is with us, that he is for us, that he promises to never abandon us. In fact, that's what God or Jesus says to us at the end of Matthew's gospel. He says, I am with you always, even until the very end of the age. Notice that there's no caveats, there's no, if you're the minister, I'm with you, but if you're just a normal person in the pews, I'll only be with you on Tuesday afternoons. He's always with all of us, no matter who we are, wherever we stand. If we trust and know Jesus, he is with us. And secondly, Jesus opens our eyes. That should be our prayer as well. We sang that song earlier, open the eyes of my heart, Lord. We see in verse 27, Jesus beginning to show them that he truly is the Messiah. It says, the beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Basically, he goes through from the whole Old Testament and says, look at what God had said would happen. And this is exactly what has happened, hasn't it? Now, we don't know what bits of the Bible he used, but perhaps he went to Genesis chapter 3, where God says that one day a child of Eve's will come into the world and stamp on the devil's head and crush that devil. That it will kill the power of Satan in the world. And Jesus might have said, well, it was the cross and the tomb. If Jesus has risen from the dead, does that not mean that the devil is gone, that God rules and reigns? He might have said, look at all the passages about the temple and the sacrificial system, about the great high priest that is going to come into the future. Is Jesus not the one who has died and risen again to be our sacrifice, to be the one that we can trust in and go to? We don't have to go to the temple, we can go to Jesus. He might have turned to Isaiah and said, does Isaiah not write about a servant who must die in such a way that he becomes a suffering servant? Is Jesus not like that suffering servant who cared for others, who loved others, who gave himself up for others? Is he not that suffering servant? And a thousand other things he might have said as well, showing that Jesus was the one who was coming to get rid of evil, destroy sin, and bring forgiveness and hope to all people. Whatever he pointed them to, he wanted to show them that Jesus himself was the one who had come for them. Now, we can go to the internet or ask a thousand different people, what's your opinion about Jesus? Some might say that he's a good man or a holy man or a rebel against the Romans. Others might ludicrously say that he never existed. But outside of the Bible, we will never understand who Jesus is. That's why Jesus points them back to the Bible, because only in that will we find out who God and who Jesus truly are. After all, Romans says this, Faith comes from what is heard or read, and what is heard or read comes from the message about Jesus. Faith comes from what we read in the scriptures, in other words. If you want to understand who God is, we must get to grips with what he says to us in the scriptures. 
And later on, they go to the house, and Jesus joins them there. And we find out that although Jesus reveals himself to them, they don't get to spend much time with him there. It says that he broke the bread, and then he disappears from their sight. It's as quick as that. Jesus appears only a few more times before he goes back to heaven in just seven weeks' time. I think the point of this is that our faith is not supposed to be about um, the miracles or about all the kind of um, special things that we read about so much um, in Acts, but rather it's about um, what God has done in our lives. As Paul writes, we walk by faith and not by sight, and we sang that earlier in our song. Because when our eyes are open, we don't need to see Jesus in the same way that they have to or did back then. We have the Holy Spirit in our lives, and we're compelled to live with God's power and love residing within us. We know that God is for us, that he's, a, he's with us, that Jesus did rise from the grave, and that's all that we need to live as followers of him. And thirdly, Jesus moves us to go and share. I don't know about you, but when I have good news or a good joke, I don't have one today, but when I do have a good joke, I love to tell people um, that good joke. Um, Kirsty loves to share pictures um, with our family of Asher. And uh, when we lived um, elsewhere and here, um, we both love the sunsets. And sometimes we, we love to um, take pictures of those sunsets and share them with folk who don't live here and say, what a beautiful place we live in, how blessed we are. Perhaps you do that as well whenever you have good news, whenever you have a, a lovely picture. I remember as a child, um, maybe five or six years old, going to my grandparents' house and them getting out the old projector with the little um, slides and some of you are nodding your heads going, oh yes, I've still got them or used to do that as well. And we used to see all the pictures of my um, parent or my mum when she was a little girl with my aunt on holiday at Blackpool or wherever else it might have been and just seeing all these old pictures and them sharing that with us. It was the same with these two people. They had heard this amazing news and they couldn't hold it in. Their eyes were opened and they wanted everyone else to see and hear what they had witnessed. Listen to their excitement in verse 32. Were not our hearts burning within us while well, he talked with us in the road and opened the scriptures to us? Did not our hearts burn within us? Something had stirred within them. Their hearts were moved and they got up and ran at once to Jerusalem to tell their friends about Jesus. Not later, not once they went through 20 steps on how to tell your friends about Jesus' program, at once they went. And all of us who know and who love Jesus should be moved by a similar experience. Because Jesus is still the one who's alive, who's come to us when we were lost, who's come to be our saviour and our friend. We should not contain it. It changes everything. I've said before that my parents and my family, most of my wider family, are, are not Christian. I don't get to see them very often living um, many hours away, but when I do see them, something within me says, I want them to see and know and love Jesus. Now, it doesn't mean that every time, in fact, I never have, got out the Bible and said, Mum and Dad, let's do um, a whole Bible study uh, where we sit here for three hours and I preach to you. But something within me says, I want them to somehow experience Jesus. It might be that they say something that says, uh, let me pray for you. So when my grand died um, last year, um, I, I think my grand was a Christian, I said, or we said to um, my dad, we're praying for you. It wasn't a big thing, it wasn't flashy, it wasn't me standing in front of the church and preaching to them, but something within me said, I want them to know and experience something of Jesus. And I hope that that would be the same with you. When you encounter and you spend time with your family and friends and neighbours and colleagues who don't know Jesus, something within you says, I want them to know Jesus. I want them to experience something of the love and hope and joy that Jesus has brought to me. And if you've never felt that, or if you don't feel that, my question would be, why? Why would you not want them to know that love, to know that joy, to know that hope, to know that peace, to know eternal life? Why would you not want them to know that? Cleopas and his friend desperately wanted at once to go and tell their friends. Again, I'm not asking or expecting anyone to go and stand in the street corner or to stand up in your office when you get back to working in your office and stand on your desk and shout out, Jesus is alive! If you do that though, please film it. I want to see that. <laughs> but you could do that, but I'm not expecting you to do that. You could just be a good friend, a good neighbour, and offer to pray for someone. You could say, how about you come to church with me one Sunday? 
or point them to something that they could read. Give them a, a book, um, a Christian book, or something else that shows them or explains them something of the love and joy and hope of Jesus. Let me close with this. Do you realize that Jesus is the one who sought you out? When you were lost, when you'd wandered away from Jesus, he still came to you. He's a good shepherd who leaves in 99 and comes after you and me. He comes to our messiness, born in Bethlehem, lives in poverty, and then dies on the cross. All of us need a savior. All of us, whoever we are, God comes to us and is that savior. And so let us this Easter season, as we continue to think upon Easter, thank God for opening our eyes to what he's done for us. Let us live in thankfulness that our sins are wiped clean, that we have the joy and hope of resurrection life, that we are a new creation, that Jesus has come for people like you and me. And let us go and live our life centered on Jesus, proclaiming Jesus whatever way we can, living in his ways, for Jesus has opened our eyes, and to him we give glory and praise. Let's pray. Loving and eternal God, we are in awe that you are the one who has come close to us. When we have wandered far from you, when we've turned our back on you, yet you are still that good shepherd who leaves 99, coming after the likes of us. And so we thank you. We thank you for opening our eyes to your good news, that Jesus is alive, that hope is here, that there is eternal life, that there is joy here and now. Lord, where our hearts have grown dull, where our eyes have grown blind, may you open them again. May you stir within us something again, that something to help us to see you and know you and love you like we could never dream was possible. Help us to be like Cleopas and his friend who run from meeting you to tell the whole world with joy in our hearts. May our hearts burn within us as we encounter you. And change us, God, we turn to you in prayer for our church, our community, and our world because you command us to. You call on us to bring what's on our heart to you, to know that you are a loving Heavenly Father who's eager to hear from his children. And so as your children who have been met with Jesus, those who have trusted in the promise of the cross and the empty tomb, we turn to you. We pray for our church family. We ask you to be with those who are battling ill health and pain and sorrow in these days. For those who are anxious and stressed. For those who have unspoken worries and hurts. Give them strength in their weariness, hope in their despair, comfort in their pain and joy in their sorrow. We pray for the Strachan family at the loss of John just yesterday morning. We pray for his widow Mary and their wider family. And we comfort them and be with them, we pray, as they mourn and as they grieve. And Almighty God, of course, this week marked the end of an era after the death of Prince Philip. Lord, we thank you for that long life lived. We thank you for that life of service to our country in the wider Commonwealth. We thank you for the example shown in 73 years of marriage and that commitment to one another. We thank you, God, for that life of challenge and innovation, for dedication to conservation and the environment, for a life supporting and encouraging young people. Lord, this day we lift to you in prayer the Queen and the whole royal family at this time in, of grief. But in these days, they're not princes and princesses, dukes or duchesses. They're just like any of us in a time of grief. A grieving wife, sons and daughters, grandchildren and friends. Normal people, mourning the loss of a friend and loved one. And so, Lord, may you astound them with the warmth of your embrace. May they know your comfort and your guidance. And be with our nation and those who particularly will find this a hard time for them in these days. We pray too for Northern Ireland. After two weeks of trouble on their streets, we pray for the police as they try to bring peace, as they try to stop the violence and the 
the petrol bombs and the, the hurt and the pain that's been caused. We pray for those predominantly young folk who are running amok in the streets. Lord, may you bring them to their senses. May you cause them to, this evening, not leave their house. Force them, stop them from causing mayhem in the streets, causing violence and terror. Lord, we pray for peace and unity to all sides of the debate, to to all sides of the conflict and the ongoing animosity in that nation. Lord, bring peace, bring harmony, bring rest, we pray. Lord, we've just been hearing about how you opened the eyes of Cleopas and his friend. And Lord, we pray for our eyes to be opened, for us to see miracles happening in our midst, for to see your presence in us and amongst us, in our community and in our church. Give us hearts that love you, that serve you, that want to help others to find you as well. Break down our hearts of stone, open our blind eyes, to see you in all of your glory and your wonder. This day and forevermore we pray. We are going to um, close um, in praise with Be Thou My Vision, O Lord of My Heart. Again, we'll stand for this hymn and we'll say the final verse, um, verse 5. So, Be Thou My Vision, O Lord of My Heart. Let's stand and worship God. My King of Heaven, after victory won, may I reach heaven's joys, O bright heaven's sun. Heart of my own heart, whatever befall, still be my vision, O ruler of all. So may the blessing and the power and the wonder of Jesus, who's opened our eyes, go with you and all who you love, today and forevermore. Amen. Please take a seat and uh, I'll see you at the door.